All right. Um, hi, all. Uh, welcome today. Uh, I will first off say that I am not Cassandra. Unfortunately, Dr. Olds is not available to participate. She um, had a medical emergency and is, is out with family. Uh, so I am Sonia Swiger. I'm going to be filling in for her as well as doing my own. Um, so I will begin by giving her presentation and then I will give my presentation. You look like you're sharing the right one. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> All right. So first we'll get started. We're going to talk about pesticide resistance and integrated pest management. Uh, when we do this, we're going to start by talking about house flies, and then we'll roll into some other flies when we get into the presentation that I was intending to give. Um, so the reason we want to talk house flies and the reason they are such a concern is that they're more than just a nuisance. House flies are also known pathogen carriers for many different things, as well as bacteria that is now resistant to antibiotics. And this can cause real concern when we're trying to take care of our animals and when we're also trying to take care of getting rid of these insects that are pests. So what does this really look like? Um, you know, this is a, just some pictures here of usage of auger plates that have been treated with different drugs to show the impact or no impact when they've been touched by flies that may or may not have some exposure previously to these drugs. So what is shown here is when you have these growth colonies on each of these augers, it means that there is resistance because if there was not, there would not be any growth colonies that are occurring. So from the left, you see the plate that has no antibiotics, which should have quite a few um, resistance or not really resistance, but that's your control because there is nothing there to stop the growth of those colonies. But as you move down the into the slide, you'll see that there's different types of products or drugs in this case that these animals were would be exposed to that the flies are getting exposed to and they are becoming resistant, which is of concern because if they're moving these resistant drugs amongst animals, it can cause health concerns. So talk a little bit about musket fly biology. Uh, the fly biology is heavily driven by their food sources and what it is that they want to consume. Those food sources are gonna be both sugar and proteins because the adults need both of those, especially the female stages. Most flies need a protein source in that adult stage in order to produce eggs. So that is definitely going to drive their attraction. And because they're flies, they have kind of a different opinion on what they find to be a good food source. So they are attracted to the animals for many reasons. One is the manure, that's kind of the most obvious, but there's also other things such as the secretions that are found around the eyes or around the nose of these animals. And that's when we run into those issues when you have flies that are both going to the manure, manure and then going back up to those secretion sites and then causing um, transmission of pathogens that probably don't want to have interacting. One of the main ways to basically limit those flies is to reduce access to the food, which then reduces the number of eggs that can be produced. For most situations and most flies, they're gonna lay a couple eggs, which is usually about 10 to 100 at a time. Uh, shown here in this picture is those little white um, rice looking things. Those are the eggs of the house fly in particular. They're gonna put them in clusters and then other flies are going to join in and lay their eggs in the same spot that that original fly put their eggs. The larvae are gonna to grow together in those resources, again, which is mostly of manure habitat, but it could be some variations in some type of vegetation. There'll be a little bit of moisture to that habitat. They don't do very well in super dry conditions and they do better when they're in groups together. It helps them break that food source down. When they finally have finished up their development, which takes a, you know, a few days to a couple of weeks, depending on our time of the year, they're gonna pupate. And at this point, they do wanna find a drier substrate. Um, so they may come to the top of those sources or they may actually crawl out of those resources they were utilizing in the larval stage to, to do that pupation. Um, that just allows them uh, the ability to dry their exoskeleton and make that pupa and then also for emergence when they become the adults. 
So one of the things that happens though is that these populations get out of control super fast. And how does this happen, right? It has to do with the fact that you have one female who can lay basically up to a hundred eggs. And if she's good at what she does, she can even lay more than that. But to make it easy to understand, we'll talk only about a female that's laying a hundred eggs. So one female lays a hundred eggs in her lifetime. And then about a couple of weeks later, you have about 10% survivability out of that day. So therefore you now have 10 flies that have lived out of those 10 flies. Five of those are going to be females because roughly speaking, most of the times our populations are 50, 50 males to females. So now you have five females who can lay a hundred eggs and obviously 10% of those five females, hundred eggs are going to survive. So now we have 50 surviving females from that group uh, because we had 10% survival, half of which are females. And then within a month, you have a success rate of 10% and they basically have almost tripled or more in size because they're able to retain those populations. So it doesn't take long for us to have a fly problem. And of course, that's one of the things we get asked about all the time is where did all these flies come from? Well, it only took one female and now you have hundreds to replenish what she uh, passed forward. When it comes to the usage of pesticides, that is really kind of our mainstay. That's what we do for fly control. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but there is other things that need to be utilized at the same time. And the one reason why is because of pesticide resistance, which is something that is extremely prevalent, especially when we're talking house flies. Out of the flies that I'm usually working with and most of us in the field are, the house fly is the hardest to kill. The reason it's the hardest to kill is because it's resistant to all these uh, chemicals that we have on the market. So this is a study that was conducted to kind of look at the impact of a chemical, which this is actually flor um, and that's a uh, that's what's in Brevecto. And Brevecto Active is not a product you can find on the market for houseflies. It has no usage at all that overlaps at this time. But they utilized this product and tested it on wild caught flies and they found resistance and all of the females and in, in, in all of the states that are indicated here and in most of the male populations. And that's really concerning. And what's happening is it's crossover resistance because of the usage of other chemicals that are similar uh, to this one and causing the flies to not even die to a product they've never been exposed to. There are different types of resistance that we're familiar with right now. Uh, these pesticide resistances can be listed as both behavioral resistance and physiological resistance. When we're dealing with behavioral resistance, it's a little different. It's that it, it's really more about the fact that the flies do not want to interact with what we're putting out there. Um, they're no longer interested in the bait. They're no longer going to the attractant traps. It's a behavioral change. It doesn't mean that product isn't killing them. They're just not getting exposed to it. They're preventing themselves from going to it prior to having any interaction. What we normally deal with is going to be physiological resistance. And this is a change in the um, way the chemicals impact the insects, meaning this is what we think of more traditionally when we think about pesticide resistance, they flies now have a mutation or they're not breaking down the product of the way they used to. It's just not impacting them the same as it would have originally. Um, but now, and now we're having this effect on them. So there's a really no effect is what's happening. And this can even lead to cross resistance, which was what was shown in that previous slide with that interaction with the Brevecto active. That is something they've never been exposed to. So kind of break this down to hopefully make it a little bit more ex um, understandable. Kind of look at dogs, right? So we do a lot of selective breeding when it comes to dogs. Um, and while I did not put this slide in there, I love it because I am a Great Dane owner myself. But we pick these traits out of these dogs to make them what they are, to get these different breeds, to get these different sizes. And even though they're all still of the same species, technically speaking, right? They're all still dogs. Um, but when we you know you, you, if you're into Great Danes, there's different ways that you can breed them to have them either larger or have them even taller. It just depends on how you want to do it. And the same is is adverse, adversely seen in chihuahuas based on certain characteristics. So then we take this over into flies. And one of the big difference, of course, with flies is that generation times are super fast. So we're not, you know, taking months, we're taking days to weeks to get to these new generations. But what's happening is we do select for resistance when we overuse some of our products. So just kind of break that down. So we're starting here with this cow that has the population without pesticide resistance. So we go and treat this cow 
with its flies on it and everybody's going to die because there's no resistance. Everything reacts to the product we put out. Everything is killed. But what happens is we have to use product more than once, unfortunately. And sometimes if we use those same products too close together or more re too regularly, or we never rotate, we're now overexposing those flies. And that means that they didn't die the first time. So now they're being hit multiple times or they're just hitting so often that you're, you're starting to find that trait that makes them survive that impact. So what's indicated in the next cow here is we now have a white fly. That isn't an actual white fly, but it's a fly, it's in white, right? So that fly indicates our pesticide resistance fly. So we now have five flies that should die when we treat, but now we have one fly that won't die when we spray because it's resistant. So we do our sprays, we kill our five flies, but we have one fly that lived. And that one fly is going to lay 100 eggs or more and regrow that population within a month tenfold. So now we're going to run into the situation where that one fly passed forward those traits that made it so it didn't die in the first place. It is resistant. And now we have an overabundance of flies that are now pesticide resistant. And what also can happen is this crossover resistance, which is what was shown in that earlier present slide where the products that were tested against it, because the products are similar, they have some traits that are similar, they cause this crossover resistance. And even though we switched our product now, it may be too late and we may get some that die. And then again, we may not. We're really not entirely sure if we'll always get crossover resistance, but we are seeing evidence of that. So we want to combat this insecticide resistance. The first of many ways to do this is using an integrated pest management approach program. This is what many of us are always recommending and, it's, and it serves its purpose. It can be a little bit more labor intensive, but that's kind of the whole point of being integrated. Uh, this is not a new concept. This has been out there for many decades. It's just now teaching new people that we need to keep doing this practices. And then we also want to be mindful of how we utilize the pesticides when we do have to use them. Generally speaking, we refer to this integrated pest management pyramid. The pyramid is designed to show where our products fall in reference to how we want to approach them. So the concept is you always start at the bottom and your pyramid is always larger at the bottom. And that means you should do more of the lower parts of the pyramid before you increase up to the higher parts, which is going to be your chemical usage. It doesn't mean you can't use all parts of the pyramid, but there should be some emphasis on the cultural side of management in order before really starting to do too much chemical so that you have an overall integrated approach to managing. And I'm gonna break this pyramid down. So, so first being our cultural. So good sanitation, changing of the habitats. What you're trying to do here is you're trying to eliminate the breeding sites, those sites where the larvae are found. And this can only be done by people doing something about it. We have to manually go out there. We have to be labor intensive and remove those resources so that we can take away those locations for those eggs to lay and the larvae to grow and for that population to exponentially increase over time. To do this, you need to actually go out and find those resources that they're utilizing, whether it's on a dairy or in a beef situation or even around poultry, there's going to be different habitats that they like, but they're usually going to be relatively similar in that they're going to utilize the manure or they're going to utilize the feed, but it's some type of a substrate that's decomposing and has some moisture. Now, the pupa are going to be a more of a drier habitat, but that's an easy indicator. Maybe they're already empty, but you at least can tell you, yeah, we definitely are having a problem here. Physical and mechanical controls is adding things that you can help you in your sanitation practices. So you put these up in addition, they're usually going to be pesticide free. So that's why they're helpful. So usage of fans that will help prevent flies from being able to grow up fly really well. And then also screens and traps and things of that sort to kind of catch those excess adult flies. Biological controls, those are predators and parasites that are going to attack your larval stages. That would be um, impactful. Um, if you're going to utilize parasitoid wasps, you need to make sure they're designed to be the ones to go after flies. And then we lead into our chemicals. 
So again, this is going to be anything else would fall into chemical control uh, and the usage of those should be more liberal um, when possible and only when needed. So there are some, you know, we want to wait until we're actually seeing a big problem and that we maybe have already tried some other practices and we still need to do something to get rid of those with flies. So just some guidelines, uh, follow the label um, for the application of mountain storage. Be sure that you do that properly. If you're treating animals directly, you need to have the proper weight of those animals to be sure you're putting the proper amount. If we don't use the correct dosage, that's when we get resistance. If we apply products incorrectly, that's when things get really bad. So we don't want to do that. Think about where you are applying this product and when, how much contact is going to be, um, what's that going to impact, whether it's humans, pets, animals themselves or children, you need to know all that based on your situation. Use good annual rotation. Um, this can get a little trickier. It's, it's a little harder to find rotations in all types of products, but if they're there, use them. Switch from a pyrethroid to organophosphate and then maybe even a macrocyclic lactone if it's available. And this is not just changing the product I grabbed off the shelf. You have to read the active ingredient. And then think about areas that you're using other types of pesticides and that impact that it's having on the flies. 